they were decreasing in mass. Uh, the diencephalon, which is the, the core of your brain, uh, was getting smaller. The hippocampus, which has to do with memory, was getting smaller. Uh, the amygdala, which has to do with emotion, is also degenerating. It's deteriorating uh, because of the thiamine, the, the loss of, of thiamine. And the frontal cortex, and that's the part that, that they think would. Uh, so potentially, they really didn't seem very smart. They really didn't seem very smart while they were uh, drinking, but um, then it seemed to get permanent for them. Uh, and, and that's uh, mainly because the, the frontal cortex uh, was, uh, was deteriorating, as was the hippocampus. So they couldn't remember anything. All of a sudden, they couldn't remember anything. But the part that really drove you crazy was the fact that all of a sudden, you know, before they were kind of, they were, uh, they reacted to things and they were fairly emotional. All of a sudden, it went away. It was gone. And it uh, didn't happen anymore. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's what happens with people uh, who drink too much and drink uh, for an extended length of time. They, have, they get, they, uh, get a uh, syndrome known as Kor Kor Korsakoff syndrome. And the reason is because uh, their body is processing so much alcohol <clears throat> that, uh, they, uh, that the body can't process uh, vitamin B1, which is thiamine. Another name for it, of course, is thiamine. And that's just the way it works. Uh, one of the interesting things is that since they, uh, they're used to, to remembering things and all of a sudden they can't, uh, all of a sudden all you need to do is implant an idea in their brain and they will, they will assume that it's, it's completely true. And of course, uh, this is known as confabulation. Very odd uh, people who are, uh, have uh, long-term alcohol use. Uh, we talked about the Estonian uh, scientist Indel Tolving. Uh, he's the one that, uh, that uh, decided that declarative memory, uh, there were two, two different types of declarative memory. Uh, one is semantic memory, uh, that's, uh, that's the, inf the information that you're accumulating right now but since you're working in this class. Uh, that's uh, all the information you have and you play the game trivial pursuit or whatever. Um, and the other has to do with episodic memory. Episodic memory is autobiographical material. So it's uh, you remembering uh, where you went to the uh, where you went to school for the first grade, and maybe you remember going to your grandmother's house, and, uh, things like that. Uh, that's episodic memory. Semantic memory has to do with general information. An episodic memory has to do with autobiographical memory. Uh, what has happened to you? Uh, once upon a time in a land far, far away, not that far away, probably the United States, uh, an individual by the name, uh, by the, uh, with the initials of KC, uh, sustained an injury due, due to a traffic accident. Uh, in his traffic accident, he damaged the, uh, uh, the frontal parietal cerebral cortex. He damaged the right parietal occipital uh, cerebral cortex. He had severe shrinkage of his hippocampus, which meant that he uh, was having problems establishing new memories, and he had severe shrinkage of his parahippocampal cortex. Uh, the hippocampus, of course, is, is a relatively long structure. Uh, the hippocampus itself is the entire structure. The parahippocampal cortex is the middle of that structure. So he had severe shrinkage throughout his hippocampus. Uh, due to the damage, uh, Casey lost his ability to recall episodic or autobiographical memories. In other words, he couldn't remember anything by himself. As curious as that is. Now, most people, like, if you, you can ask just about anybody, and of course, they're going to tell you about who they are. Uh, they know who they were, who they are, and who they have been in the past. Uh, so uh, autobiographical memories are, are very strong. Uh, if you've ever been around somebody with Alzheimer's disease, usually that individual, uh, the, one, the last memories they have are, are who they are and, uh, and where they've been. Sometimes their, their memories will go back to their childhood, and they will, they will start talking about friends they had when they elementary school or kindergarten. Uh, it's really kind of curious the way it works. I was uh, working uh, at a uh, 
rural health clinic in Oklahoma, and uh, we uh, we were going back and forth uh, to a nursing home, and uh, some of the individuals at the nursing home had Alzheimer's disease. Well, one day I was tasked with going in and drawing blood from a lady that I had drawn blood from uh, half a dozen times. Uh, I, I was aware of who she was, she knew who I was, but uh, of course we, we weren't really on speaking terms since all I did was draw her blood early in the morning, and half the time she was half asleep. Uh, so on, the, on a given day, I went in and instead of her being in bed and half asleep, she was standing there without any clothes on, uh, in front of her television set, screaming. As soon as I came in the room, she started yelling at me, uh, Johnny, what the hell are you doing in here? Of course, my name's not Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to be here. What are you doing here? And she grabbed a hold of the television set, which was, this is a long time ago. It was back in the 90s. <coughs> so the television sets weren't screens. They were like three, they were weighed a ton. They were huge. And she grabbed this thing with one arm and she just threw it across the room. Well, the room was, well, it was, she was as far back as that screen right there. And she threw it at me. And I'll tell you what, that thing flew all the way through the air, and I sidestepped it and landed right beside me. I mean, I, if I hadn't moved, she would have hit me with the television set. And of course, the nurse, as soon as the thing hit the ground, it exploded. Well, it exploded. It, it broke, and it made a loud noise. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm over here going, what the hell's going on? You know, and she's over there without any clothes on, screaming at me, did Johnny get out of the room? One of those kinds of and um, but eventually, what what happened was, uh, was that the nurses came in and they uh, they were laughing. They thought it was funny. That, for one thing, that she didn't have any clothes on. Actually, thought that they thought that was funny. You know how nurses are. They've got strange senses of humor. And they also thought it was funny that she had thrown the television at me. Well, I went I went along my rounds and I drew blood from everybody else and I came back and I said, Can I draw? Oh, no, you can't. Uh, you, why don't you come back tomorrow? Uh, and I did. I, I came back the next day, even though I wasn't supposed to. We were only supposed to uh, work with this nursing home once a, once a week. Uh, but I went back and drew her blood. And the next day, she was fine. Uh, so what was going on? Well, she, she had uh, episodic uh, memory, uh, obviously. She was yelling at me about Johnny. Uh, they assumed that Johnny, who was Johnny? Well, Johnny didn't turn out to be anybody that anybody knew or remembered. Uh, eventually, they figured out that Johnny was a kid in her class, in her, in her, uh, in her first grade class, who died when he, in the first grade. <laughs> he died of some scarlet fever or something. As bizarre as that is, so why in the world did she identify me as Johnny? Well, she had Alzheimer's disease, and she was making all these odd connections in her brain. Uh, and somehow, I, uh, she identified me as Johnny. The next day, when I went back, uh, she was lucid and wide awake, and, and uh, uh, she, she asked me about her, her television set, like I had broken her television set. Do you think, you think you're going to replace it? No, I don't think I will. <laughs> anyway. Okay, episodic memory. So that was episodic memory. Uh, she, and, and she was, uh, actually she died about six months later of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, that, this was probably the last thing that uh, she ever did and said, was uh, attacking me as Johnny, the kid that died at age six from scarlet fever. Uh, Casey still maintains semantic memory, but he can't remember who he is. The problem seems to be in the damage to his cortex, not to the damage of, uh, to the hippocampus. Researchers feel that it is the frontal parietal damage that causes the loss of memory in uh, KC. <coughs> Memory can be divided into uh, two structured stages. 
uh, iconic memory and echoic memory. Uh, initial presentation of a stimulus arrives in the brain as a momentary stimulation that can readily disappear, and usually that's what happens. Uh, iconic memory, what you see, what you hear, uh, all of this, uh, all of this information uh, is fleeting, is relatively fleeting, and you have to uh, you have to force it into your short-term memory in order to remember it. Uh, why would you do that? While well, you're trying to remember uh, the beginning of, of a sentence that I am speaking. Uh, you're trying to remember what you're seeing on the, on the board. And, of course, that forces it into short-term memory. Short-term memory is iconic or archaic memory that the individual seeks to maintain. This may last for a minute or so, uh, long enough for you to remember what I said in the beginning of my sentence. Uh, intermediate memory is short-term memory that you are able to hold because of its novel subject uh, or that is readily organized in the brain. Uh, for example, the weather report, uh, you probably remember that I was attacked by a lady, a naked lady, suffering from Alzheimer's disease with a television set. You probably remember all that because it's relatively novel. People rarely tell you about stories about naked women attacking naked, very old women. Let me tell you, she was ancient. <laughs> And normally, and I'll tell you what, she swept that, that television set with her one arm and she threw it. I literally threw it across the room. Uh, it was like a bullet. It was like a rock. It was like... <laughs> it, was, it was like she shot it out of a gun, by golly. And I'll tell you what, if I had stepped to the side... And one of the reasons that it didn't, it didn't really impact as much as hard as it could have was because it was plugged into the wall and, and as it was flying through the air it had to pull that plug out and that kind of slowed it down a little bit. So when it hit, it hit the ground instead of hit the wall. But it would have hit the wall right beside me. As crazy as that is. <clears throat> she didn't get a television set, if I remember correctly. She never they never replaced the television set. But that thing must have weighed two or three hundred pounds. I mean it was heavy. It was one of those huge. I mean, it was a big television set with a big screen. Wow. <clears throat> My son had one like that. We had to move it one time, and it took both of us. He's a weightlifter. I used to be relatively strong, and it took both of us to move that damn thing. And she just swept it right off the right off the uh, cabinet there. Long-term memory, uh, shorter duration memory that is placed in a more permanent area of the cerebral cortex where it may be recalled days, months, or even years after the fact. And of course, uh, you're always trying to uh, recall these things. Um, and we'll talk about how in the world you get these, this information out of your long-term memory. And then there is uh, a thing called permanent memory. Uh, permanent memory will last a lifetime. Uh, things that happened to you in your past, uh, all, of these, all of this information come, may come back. Uh, you may remember how to do algebra from uh, when you were in high school or whatever. Uh, you know, this is relatively permanent information. Uh, so in 50 years or so, when somebody asks you to do algebra, you'll go, well, here, let me Google it. Well, no, I just can't do that. <laughs> you're going to have to do it all by yourself. You're out in the middle of, of the desert and somebody asks you to do algebra, you'll be able to do it. How in the world do you remember that? Well, it's in your permanent memory, of course. Uh, so some of the things, some of the things that you were taught as a child, uh, you can still remember. You can still remember people talking to you uh, and giving you little pieces of information uh, about your family, about whatever. Uh, this goes into your permanent memory, and it will never be gone. Just like Johnny. Uh, Johnny was in this uh, lady's permanent memory, and uh, that was one of the last things she remembered because she started uh, really declining after that. <clears throat> And uh, one of the last things she talked about was, was Johnny. And she thought I was he. I don't know why I look like Johnny. Maybe I was about the same height he was. Long term memory can be accomplished using several techniques uh, skill learning, uh, learning challenging uh, tasks over several sessions. Um, I told you before that uh, in order to put something in your long term memory, you need to do it three times. Usually that's the way it works. Uh, so if you go over your notes, uh, if, if you, you and you have to, next week is final week, uh, so potentially one of the things that you're going to need to do next week is 
take a final for somebody. You don't have to take a final for me. But you'll have to take a final for somebody, maybe. And the way to do it is to go over your notes three times. If once you have, you've gone over three times, all that information is in your brain permanently. Uh, so you won't really have to worry about uh, not remembering it. So all you have to do is do it three times. It's a, it's a, it's a trick. It's a, mad, it's a magic trick. Uh, priming uh, is uh, stimuli that is altered due to previous exposure to the same or similar stimuli. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why you remember select uh, pieces of information. Uh, potentially you've been through a biology class uh, and they talked about some of this information. Uh, and so the information I get, I'm giving you is probably very similar to what you learned before. And now all you're doing is you're putting those two pieces of information together. You're all, your brain is already primed to remember it because whoever it was, Dr. Robinson or whoever your professor was, uh, tried to put all that information in your brain. So when he did that, of course, uh, he, was, he was creating a memory and all I'm doing is priming that, uh, that memory. Theoretically, that's what all this class is supposed to be about. You're supposed to have taken a, uh, a biology class before you, take, you, you uh, had taken this class. So potentially all you're doing, all I'm doing is priming you to remember all of uh, this, this relatively new but similar information, and that's known as priming. Conditioning is tying a stimulus response to a reward or, or to a punishment. If I gave you a piece of candy every time you got something right, and actually if we get through this chapter, uh, you will be taking the, 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 uh, the chapter quiz in class, just like we did the last of the chapter. Uh, then uh, uh, if I gave you a piece of candy every time you got one right, then uh, that would be conditioning. Uh, there are two types of conditioning, of course. Uh, classical conditioning, where you tie a stimulus response to an unconditioned stimulus, uh, like uh, uh, me praising you, that would be an unconditioned stimulus. If you want me to praise you, therefore you would learn the information so that I would praise you. Operating conditioning, of course, is uh, where we use either a reward or a punishment, and that's how we train you. Okay, um, don't write any of these down. Gather, haunt, ring, bolt, bother. Trunk, minimum, bright, scream, mildew, slap, tower, canter, uh, mumble, jar, article, dream, enable, frankly, and kneel. Those are the words I want you to try to remember. Uh, it all depends on, on how you've been trained, uh, how, what they taught you in school. Uh, it has something to do with genes as to whether, which, one, which ones of these words you will remember. If you are, are, have been trained by the military, potentially you will remember all of the words. If you've been trained as a spy, you'll remember all of these words. I certainly can't remember all of them, but then again, I was just a medic. Uh, if you remember the words in the beginning, then that's known as the primacy effect. If you remember the words at the end, that's the recency effect. And if you remember the ones in the middle, those are known as that's known as serial position effect. I know. And so everybody will remember a select group of, uh, of words. Uh, so you, if you try to remember which ones you remember, then you can tell yourself whether you remember things in the beginning or things in the end. Now this is really kind of interesting because if you're a privacy person, then the first, first person to talk, let's say you're the boss and you're a privacy person, then the first person that talks to you is going to make the most impact on you. Let's say you're a recency person. That means the last person to talk to you is going to make the, the biggest impact on you. What if you're a serial position person? That means you're, you're very flexible. You, can, uh, you will accept whatever somebody tells you. But if you've ever been, or if you've been around, then you know that bosses Sometimes bosses will, whoever gets to them first, is the person that's going to influence them the most. Or they may be a person that if you can catch them just before they go into a meeting to make their decision, if you're, you catch them just before the meeting, you can influence them the most. Of course, the kind of 
the lust to have is the one with the serial position effect. In other words, the one who accepts all information and categorizes it that way. Uh, but there are, I, and I have been around bosses, I've been around for a long time, and I've had bosses that if you got to them first, by golly, that's what the, they, and they ran with that. You know, it didn't make any difference if it made any sense or not. If you were the first one to get to them, then you, then they were uh, more influenced by you than anybody else. But if, but I've also been around bosses that it's, whatever they hear last is, is all that they will repeat because that's all they remember. Um, idiot bosses. All my bosses have been idiots, unfortunately, so it's really kind of <laughs> uh, Anyway, okay, so serial position effect, uh, all of these, uh, all of, uh, recency effect and privacy effect, it all has to do with uh, uh, individuals and how they remember things. Now this is really kind of important as far as uh, politics are concerned. <clears throat> because in the last election, we seem to have elected somebody that I don't know how much sense it makes for him to be the president of the United States. However, there was a lot of misinformation out there, and it seems like some of it was coming, obviously some of it was coming from the Russians. We know that there was information on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, they were buying um, advertisements from Google. They were buying advertisements on Facebook. And a lot of this was political stuff, and I can remember reading it, reading it as I was uh, uh, going through last year's election. I'm very interested in politics. Politics is one of my areas of expertise. Uh, so I was actually noticing what was going on. It turns out that the Russians were coming up with this stuff. Okay, so uh, why in the world, I mean, this, it was all BS. Why in the world did people believe it? Well, the reason they believed it is because People will believe, you can implant false memories in people, uh, especially if, if you pretend that you're an authority. I can remember uh, going on Facebook, and I got a lot of, I'm, I'm, not, I'm relatively liberal, and I, I remember, I have friends who are conservative, and they were sending me all these Facebook things about you know, Hillary uh, raping children. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this story. <laughs> Uh, but they came up with this story that, uh, that this one pizza parlor in New York City was being used uh, as a child trafficking area, and, and it was owned by Bill and Hillary, and they were accumulating children. They were, they were uh, taking them overseas and raping them, uh, and, and then murdering them overseas. Uh, but the, it, it, it all stemmed from this one pizza parlor in New York City. Well, that pizza parlor really does exist, so at one point, a, a uh, conservative gunman uh, went to the pizza parlor and uh, he drew his weapon outside of the, uh, the pizza parlor and he was going to go in and shoot the place up. And the cops came in and they disarmed the guy and it turns out that he was reacting to all of, the, all of this false information that was going on. Fascinating stuff. But the reality is, I'm, yes ma'am. I, I Do you remember? Yeah, I yeah. heard that on a late night show on the radio, and I was like, "What?" I, I just couldn't believe it. So I just turned it off and wanted to listen because it was so untrue. Yeah, it, I didn't think it was true. <laughs> it's just, uh -huh. I mean, it was ludicrous. It was a story that somebody made up. There are a lot of people that are that are susceptible to false memories. <clears throat> it turns out that twenty five percent of 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 the population. Uh, responds very readily to these things. They respond to false memories. These individuals are also very easy to hypnotize, as confusing as that is. Now, unfortunately, all these people voted. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know. Which is kind of tragic if you think about it, uh, because whatever's in the news is what they're going to respond to. And uh, it, it doesn't have to be in, in the legitimate news. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why they're we have a president that's talking about fake news, and, and usually he's attacking the news agencies that most people consider very accurate. Uh, CNN, CBS, NBC, uh, and then there are other uh, news agencies that are less, considered less accurate, and those are the ones that he uh, uh, adheres to. Here I am attacking the president of the United States. I apologize 
Uh, it's a very political situation, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> it just shows you uh, what, has, what has happened in the past and what can potentially happen in the future. We have one quarter of our population is very susceptible to, to these, uh, these, these false news, these false uh, attacks uh, by uh, news agencies, by, by bogus news agencies. And as it turned out, of course, it, it may have come, most of this information may have come out of Russia. Uh, troll farms, they call them, as interesting as it is. And we'll see what happens. It's, it's going to be fascinating to watch how all this stuff in, in, uh, unfolds. Uh, the ability of implanting false memories uh, clouds the accuracy of such controversial memory formation as recovered memories of childhood sexual or physical abuse. And of course, this has been used in the past. Uh, individuals have gone into counseling and they've got problems. Uh, so the, and the counselor is getting uh, information about um, uh, childhood sexual or physical abuse that, that took place. Um, and sometimes these are false memories. Uh, children, of course, if you think about uh, uh, children and some of the things that they are, are, are afraid of, one of the things they're afraid of is the monster in the closet. And sometimes they have a monster under their bed, and of course they're very much afraid of the dark. Um, <clears throat> the dark is a dangerous place, I guess. It can be, potentially. Uh, especially if they left their toys out and you go to try, try to go trotting across the, the room, you may trip over what they put there. But the reality may be that, of course, they can't tell the difference between reality and fantasy. Um, uh, there are children who have uh, Invisible friends. Where did this invisible invisible friend come from? If that's a fault, that's obviously it's obviously false. I mean, there, there is no such thing as invisible people. <laughs> we haven't found them anyway. Right? So potentially, one of the things that may be happening is they may be remembering, they may be remembering uh, a dream. They may be remembering uh, a story. They may be remembering a movie that they saw and thinking that it's reality. I can remember when I was a child, uh, I was watching a movie. It was called The Northwest Passage. And it, was about, uh, it was about the French and Indian War. Uh, and some of the things that happened in the French and Indian War were just god awful. I mean, they were, they were beheading each other, they were scalping each other, and they were massacring each other. It was just all this horrible stuff was going on. Uh, anyway, that's what the movie was about. Of course, I was just a little guy. Uh, so I remember thinking about that and, re and dreaming about that uh, for a number of, of weeks after, after I saw the movie. Uh, of course, I was a little bit older at the time. Uh, and of course, once I got into being in the military myself, I realized that well, these things really do have happened in the past, but they will happen in the future as well. Uh, but so there's a possibility uh, that individuals are remembering dreams or movies or stories as reality. They, and these are for false memories. These are forms of false memories. Um, uh, one of the traumatic things that seems to happen to individuals uh, is, is seeing their parents having sex, which doesn't make any sense to a two or three or four year old. Um, they, can't, they can't reason out what's going on. Uh, but of course, there's noise being made, and there's movement, and it looks like the, the two individuals are, are wrestling or, or fighting or whatever. Uh, so the, you know, the, a lot of this doesn't make any sense. So we, it, it is possible to implant false memories, uh, or to uh, recover false memories. And of course, it may not be a, a memory at all. It may actually be a fantasy. Uh, if you've ever uh, read the cartoon Calvin and Hobbes, of course they don't, uh, the guy stopped dra uh, uh, drawing Calvin and Hobbes, but in the old days, of course, Calvin and Hobbes came out every day. Was, is the tiger real or is the tiger actually that, that, uh, that small, small animal? The tiger seems to have a lot more reason than the kid does. The kid seems a little bit off, off kilter. But the tiger seems to know what the hell he's talking about. As, as it were. Let me see if this thing's still on. Okay. Uh, delivered testimony that has been acquired from intensive uh, questioning in a criminal trial also has questionable accuracy. 
Um, the, the more that you prime, prime a, uh, a uh, witness, uh, the more likely you're going to get false testimony or the testimony that they have been trained to deliver. Uh, selective attention. Uh, the reality is we concentrate on what we concentrate on. Uh, and sometimes we concentrate so hard that uh, we are not able to identify uh, other things that are happening. Uh, my wife is like this. One time uh, I came home from work and I walked up the stairs and I went into the living room and I looked outside and uh, our dog had uh, her favorite cat in its mouth. Well, my wife had been home for about, I don't know, five or six minutes. <clears throat> I don't know how long she'd been home. Uh, but she was standing there, and she was looking outside. Uh, and here's her cat is in the dog's mouth. Well, we knew that the dog was a cat killer. Uh, and for that reason, we tried to, to isolate the dog so that he couldn't get to the cats. And somehow, he had gotten a hold of the cat. So as I, I came up, and I looked outside, and I said, what's, what's going on? Of course, she'd been looking outside for a number of minutes and hadn't seen anything, despite the fact that her cat was being murdered by, by the dog. So I ran outside and I rescued the cat. She was almost dead. And she did die, you know, about five or six minutes later. But my wife had been standing there watching this dog and this cat, her favorite cat, and she didn't even see it. My wife has the, the ability to not see what she doesn't want to see. Of course, I saw it right away. Um, one time we were we were we were in Germany, and we were German, the German drivers were nuts. Uh, and we're driving down the road, and we're in this line of traffic, and the guy in the front's going slow. I guess he was an American. They drive too slow for the Germans. Anyway, so people started passing. Well, it was on a curvy mountain dumbest place in the world to try to pass somebody because because if, the, if there's a German coming towards you, he's going 70 or 80 miles an hour, damn it. And of course, if he's coming around the curve, you, know, you don't have time to get out of his way. And, and that's exactly what happened. So I'm watching this thing unfold. I'm in the back of the line. I'm watching this thing unfold, and I keep slowing farther and farther down. She says, why, why are you slowing down? What's going on? What's going on? You know, she was completely oblivious of the fact that we were just about to see a head-on collision. <laughs> she was completely oblivious. And of course, I put my arm out to, to, to make sure that everything was OK. I had the two kids were in the back seat. And I put my arm out to, 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 to support her. And I hit the brakes, because I didn't want to slam into the guy in front of me, who was going to, about to slam on his brakes. So as it turned out, I, I stopped about 50 feet behind everybody else. Of course, I knew what was going on, and she didn't really understand what happened until after the impact. Until, I mean, it was like five or ten seconds later that she realized what was going on. And she was looking right at the same thing that I was looking at. I didn't see it. Oh, she drives me nuts. So her cat was killed by that damn dog. And she didn't, and she was looking at it while it was being murdered, and she didn't even react to it because she, she was thinking about something else. <coughs> Selective attention. She doesn't see negative things. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see if you're as bad as my wife is. All right. Selective attention. Okay, so you're supposed to count the, no the number of passes that the white uh, people in white are making. Wait a minute, let me go back. Let me go back. Okay, you have to count the number of passes that people in white are making. Well, remember, there's two basketballs. So, you have to watch the number of passes that people in white are making. One, two, three. three. Okay. Four. Okay. Five. Six. Yeah, you need to count them. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. 
How many did you count? 16. 16? 15. Ah, not the one that bounced. <laughs> <laughs> did you see the gorilla? <laughs> did you guys see the gorilla? Oh, there it is. Yeah. So if we're concentrating on something, like my wife not seeing the dog killing the cat, <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's known as selective attention. Okay. You don't like your you're not listening to the story. Your mind somewhere else. I do that sometimes. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's possible. It's not as bad as my wife. <laughs> Especially when it gets too boring and you, want, you don't want to listen anymore. Right. Sure. <laughs> well, maybe that's what was going on. Uh, she'd been home for. But not to see a cat being killed, I would save the cat. Well, I did. I saw that. Okay, we're watching uh, them toss an apple back and forth to each other. The count how many times Evan and Thomas toss the apple back and forth. Uh, Evan and Thomas are the, the third pair from the front. And I think there's five pairs. Yeah, they're there. If this is Evan and Thomas. There we go. That one. That one. Okay. Okay. We're counting now in the ah. the passing the ball. Or the app ones are these are apples. How many did you get? I think twelve. Thirteen. Oh. <laughs> Thirteen. Okay. However, did you notice something interesting happening with the apple in the back row? They're, they're all green apples. Okay. Yeah, they were green apples. Everybody's throwing a green oh, apple. Different colors. I mean, they're, yeah, they're all... Green. Well, I guess they're all green except for one in the back that's coming out of the red apple. Or yellow apple, I guess. Oh, they switched it. Yeah, they switched Orange. it. Orange. Yeah, to a red ball. <clears throat> Selective attention, and this is one of the problems, of course, uh, this is one of the problems with dealing with um, eyewitness accounts, uh, because sometimes they have selective attention. They're concentrating on whatever they're concentrating on. And there are a lot of individuals that won't see things in the, in the periphery. They won't notice things happening. We're not getting any noise, I apologize for that. Oh, it's because of that. It's because of that. Yeah. This is a test that doesn't do the same Every time you have to do the same thing, you seem to have more than one. Let's try it again. Now, this, is this is a test that doesn't do the same Oh, I'm going to 
on it all amazing. Analytically, I assault and I make things. Broken barriers mounted by the zombie. Buildings are broken, basically I'm bombarded. Casuals in the state of town. These casualties, that's what cats got to the canopies collapsing. Detonated, I'm a tank, they've been going low. Demonstrate now, I'm dying out of on and down low. Some of the editors for each and every editor that they have left the yellow soul elevated etiquette. Curious, fabulous, fantastic. Queries of all the world. <laughs> ah, selective attention. Yeah, if you notice that the block is moving backwards. When I first watched this, um, I noticed the clock was moving backwards. Wait a second, we don't want to pause that. Okay. Okay, I noticed the clock was moving backwards, but I didn't notice the green hat, and I miscounted the exclamation points. So I actually didn't notice that the clock was moving backwards. The one thing I noticed. Anyway, okay, so we have a selective attention, and that's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be able to concentrate on one thing. We're supposed to be able to focus on one thing at a time. Uh, and that's okay, and that's good. It uh, wasn't good for my, the, my wife's cat, which I had to bury. Mm -hmm. Later on that evening, I know. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I know. It was a uh, it was a, a Manx cat. I don't know if you know what Manx is. They don't have tails, so I know. And it hopped around like a rabbit. It was really kind of cute. It had the worst voice you've ever heard. Just the worst voice in the world. And the dog killed it. Uh, and my wife didn't even see it. And of course, she got so angry at the dog that she hit it in the back. She hit it. She put her fist and she hit that dog. The dog weighed about 100, and, well, maybe 80 or 90 pounds. And she hit that dog in the back and it burst a blood vessel in its back. And he accumulated this sack of blood. <clears throat> so we had to take him to the vet and got it. We, they did surgery and we tried to pull that sack of blood off of, out of his thorax. And it, it, he died. I'm hitting it because he killed the cat. Anyway, so she killed the dog. My wife did. Memory is formed around the structure of our senses. Uh, attributes of memory include time, uh, space, sensory perceptions, response, uh, cognitive effect of the, of the stimuli. Each attribute seems to utilize different neural structures, as it turns out. From studies of brain imaging and, and memory, as well as evidence from brain damage due to injury and disease, scientists have been able to map different memory processes. Uh, spatial location. So if we're trying to remember, if you're trying to remember what you hear here, uh, you, you will remember this location. You'll remember sitting in the classroom and the information being up on the on the screen, be talking about it. And this takes place in the hippocampus. And of course, the hippocampus is this structure, this red structure right here. That is the hippocampus. So that's where those memories take place. Uh, spatial location takes place in the, uh, in the hippocampus. Uh, memory uh, of your own response to whatever's happening is in the caudate. Uh, the caudate is this uh, strange looking structure here. This is the amygdala, this is the putamen, uh, but this, this structure right here is the caudate nucleus. So that's where all of that is taking place. So what, however you responded to that, uh, with disgust or with anger or with uh, humor, uh, this, is, uh, this will take place in the caudate. Uh, and as you can see, the hippocampus is right underneath, right underneath that structure. The caudate is actually right here. I'm sorry, the hippocampus is actually right here, and this, the rest of this is the cutting. So these two structures are, are uh, adjacent to one another. And this is the part that is telling you about how you responded to whatever's taking place. Uh, object recognition uh, it takes place in the extra stride visual cortex, and the extra stride visual cortex, of course, is right in the very back of your, of your head, right in the very back of your brain, right back here. Uh, one of the reasons that we hold up the number of fingers, and I talk about this all the time, one of the reasons we hold up the number of fingers that we do when we think you've had a concussion 
is because we want to, we want to know if you have double vision. We want to know if you can't see properly. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we hold up two fingers or three fingers. Usually it's not more than that. We don't hold up. Normally we don't hold up five fingers because if, the, if you're getting double vision, that's like ten fingers in front of your face. And they're all moving at the same time. And you'll make somebody sick. Uh, so usually it's two or three three fingers that we're holding up. Sometimes it's one number. Usually it's, it's, it's a number. But the, the idea is how much damage has been done to the strike cortex, the extra strike cortex. The visual cortex back in the back of your head. If you've been hit in the front of the head, of course, you get a rebound effect in the back of your head. So that's what we're trying to determine. In a minute, we're going to talk about uh, what you hear us saying when we're holding those fingers up and uh, some of the questions that we ask. Hippocampus, special location, and of course that's the hippocampus right there. <clears throat> the caudate nucleus, one, uh, that's uh, how you respond. It's a caudate, uh, it's, uh, it takes place in the caudate nucleus. The caudate is really kind of interesting, an interesting structure. The caudate has something to do with ADHD. I know, kind of exciting. When functioning pro properly, the caudate may allow only a, a bit of frustration to travel to the frontal lobes as a reaction to an upsetting situation, such as lima beans for dinner. Nobody likes lima beans, especially little kids. Or broccoli. Kids don't like broccoli either. That's a hint and a warning. But it's good for you. Okay. But nobody likes it. However, a damaged caudate uh, may leave the gate open for too long, allowing a great deal of frustration to travel to the frontal lobes, which may result in an extremely intense emotional response. And of course, if, if you think about it, this sounds like ADHD, does it? The kid is overreacting to two situations. Why is that taking place? Because his caudate is immature, and the caudate isn't really organizing things the way it's supposed to. So he, uh, he, he, usually it's a male, that's odd as that may seem. Um, so he's becoming more frustrated from things that happen to him. More frustrated than he should uh, have, uh, be reacting to something. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the caudate. But that we're not done. The caudate also, uh, if, as long as the caudate is undamaged, it regulates and organizes information received from other areas of the brain, such as the occipital lobe, um, as you, in, in this case, uh, she's looking at her hair and saying, it's too long, I need to get a haircut. Uh, and transmits the information to the frontal lobes. The frontal lobe then instructs another area of the brain to carry out a particular task based on the transmitted information. A damaged caud caudate, on the other hand, may not properly deliver the information to the frontal lobes. The result is unawareness. In other words, you don't remember what you were thinking. Uh, it may mean that that particular task, of course, doesn't get done. 